In two minutes, primary charges will blow base charges and a few square blocks will be reduced to smoldering rubble. I know this because Tyler knows this. We're back. We're back. Hey, episode 10. It is episode 10. It's fantastic. It's um, we're here again. Um, so these are coming thick and fast now and I've got a new system for getting them all sorted out and set up. So it should, this should be up sometime today. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, got a little bit of an echo, um, but we're we're working to avoid that. Yeah, it's getting better. It's getting better and more professional. Kaizen. Yeah. Some small improvements. Damn right. The most <laughs> Japanese concept of all time. <laughs> so a bad it... plan today is better than a good plan tomorrow. Exactly. And perfect is the enemy of good. So into the news. Yeah. First up, um, UK minister says encryption on messaging services is unacceptable. unacceptable. This one is a. Uh, uh, this is, of course, thanks to Kevin. Uh, technology companies must cooperate more with law enforcement agencies and should stop offering a secret place for terrorists to communicate using encrypted messages. British Interior Minister Amber Rudd said on Sunday. Is she? Is she the Interior Minister? Or is she not the Home Secretary? That sounds very fascist. It does, doesn't it? Maybe that's why they've used that yeah. interior minister. Yeah. No, she is the Home Secretary, yeah. Um, she said, we have always been at war with Australasia. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Local Mr. one. It's been fun. Yeah. Local media have reported that British-born Khalid Massoud sent an encrypted message moments before killing four people last week by ploughing his car into pedestrians and fatally stabbing a policeman as he tried to get into Parliament in an 82-second attack that struck terror in the heart of London. No, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't strike terror in the heart of London. It struck, oh my fucking God, what is happening in people's minds? And then the next day, everybody get go back on with their lives. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how the police could have stopped him. If they to get that message. I don't yeah. think so. It's like it, it sent a cryptid message moments before. Yeah. Moments would not before. Have stopped anything. I would not have stopped shit. anything. I did bad shit. Right. Okay. It would not exactly would not have stopped anything. It, if if anything, all it would do would be um, to provide proof that he had intent afterwards. However, you know they've pretty much got everything on camera, so. You don't. I don't think that's even needed. This this will we'll come back to that later. Uh, there there may be difficulties in taking on technology companies. In the United States, officials have been trying to make U.S. To- U.S. technology firms provide a way around encryption. Um, talks like that have intensified since a mass shooting in San Bernardino. But while saying she was quote calling time on terrorists using social media as their platform end quote, Rudd also appeared for help from the owners of encrypted messaging services such as Facebook's WhatsApp, backing away from seeking to introduce new legislation. As for a view on companies which offer end-to-end encrypted messages, Rudd said, it is completely unacceptable. There should be no place for terrorists to hide. We need to make sure organizations like WhatsApp, and there are plenty of others like that, don't provide secret, a secret place for terrorists to communicate with each other. We need to make sure that our intelligence services have the ability to get into situations like encrypted WhatsApp. <laughs> Oh, excuse me. According to technology magazine Wired, end-to-end encryption means messages can only be decoded by the recipient and not by anyone in between, including the company providing the service. Uh, Brian Paddock, a Home Affairs spokesman for the opposition Liberal Democrats and former Deputy Assistant Commissioner to the Metropolitan Police, said security services could view the content of terrorist encrypted messages. The real question is, could lives have been saved in London last week if end-to-end encryption had been banned? All evidence suggests that the answer is no. See, this is what we were saying earlier. You don't even need evidence. You just need yeah. a couple of functional brain cells. Oh, yeah. Exactly. That fucking work. Yeah. The attack on Wednesday looks set to reignite the privacy versus secrecy debate in Europe, especially after warnings from security officials that Western countries will be increasingly targeted as Islamic State loses ground in the Middle East. Rudd appointed Home Secretary and appointed Home Secretary or Interior Minister shortly after Britain voted to leave the EU. 
said that the British case was different when asked about Apple's position on helping the FBI break into an iPhone from one of the San Bernardino shooters. This is something completely different. We're not saying open up. We don't want to get into the cloud. We don't want all sorts of things like that, she said. But we do want them to recognize they have responsibility to engage with government, to engage with law enforcement agencies where there is a terrorist situation. She said that she wanted to see an industry-wide board set up in Britain to allow technology companies to better police their sites and stop letting their sites, their platforms, their publishing enterprises being used by terrorists. That's a Reuters article. Yeah. Um, so they could, he could have just sent like a number by, by yeah. a text message, unencrypted, like one. Or the and that would have been enough. Or the last letter of his text could have been A. Yeah, to, to indicate that he's about to start the attack. Because There's so many different I'm just ways. I'm popping out to shopping, and I'm going to go and buy some soda. Hey, and it's just like why? I mean, uh, and that's me just thinking about it while you're reading that out. I mean, yeah. you can't stop it, that. People have been doing encryption for thousands of years. Well, people have been doing um, obfuscation of what they're saying for thousands of years. You look at you don't you don't even have to you know it's not. You don't have to look far or be that intelligent to realise that this will not work. Unless you've got blinkers on or you've got an ulterior motive. I mean, all you've got to do is make someone memorise a, a, a telephone number, go and mm-hmm. buy a mobile phone for cash and a SIM card for cash and pay for the credit on the SIM card in cash. Yep. And that's an unregistered phone and all that person has to do is memorise a number. Yeah. So that send a really, um, you know, a really sort of plain text test, me- you know, s- affirmative message, and that's it. And that's it. There's no encryption doesn't mean anything. I mean, what is it? You use WhatsApp. Yeah, the encrypt. This is the th- the whole thing about the encryption debate. Encryption does not help terrorists prevent. Well, does not prevent terrorists from being able to plan things. It does not prevent the security services from being able to do their job and investigate things because almost all the time the terrorists actually mess up at some point and don't use their encryption properly. So this this weird fear-mongering, using innocent people's deaths to push your own agenda is fucking despicable. It is, and this is what I was about to say. The, The only reason they're doing this is not because they want to monitor terrorist communications what they want is want they want to be able to monitor everyone's communications mm. that's what it is they they want to be able to monitor everything that we do they yeah. they hate the fact that we can hide something away from them and this is the thing it's like encryption is not there just to protect you from having your dirty little secrets encryption's there to protect you from people who can who are smart enough to get your information and use it to um, pretend that you're you, you know, identity fraud. That's why we have encryption. We have encryption in place because the systems that we use are not secured by default. So we have to have encryption in place. This kind of reminds me of a, a story in 2000 AD, a, a Judge Dredd sort of story, where. Um, they banned filofaxes. Filofaxes came in to, um, into fashion again. And the police hated them because if they wanted to see what somebody was up to, they'd have to actually leaf through a whole filofax to find anything incriminating. Whereas if somebody yeah. was using a cell phone or a personal communicator or a personal diary that was digital, the bike computer could read it in seconds. Mm-hmm. So they made writing shit down on paper illegal because it, it, it was a way of basically make it more difficult to find yeah and you're not going to stop people meeting you're not going to stop people planning stuff I mean this is Mm -hmm. why that attack was so amazing Uh, you know really it was a real departure from the current wave of terrorist thinking thinking we need a bomb which means we need to get hold of difficult to get substances or electronics or a knowledge of bomb making this was a terrorist attack undertaken with a knife and a car Mm. and launched with a I'm now going to do that thing we talked about yeah you know, how the fuck well, let... you, you know that message was superfluous they'd already planned it yeah he was going to do it 
and then did it in 82 seconds. You know, it's, it's unpreventable with any amount of security. There's no way you could possibly know that that was what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. but for Amber Rudd to use the deaths of innocent people and the injuries and the panic that was caused, albeit briefly, as, as a way to push forward this anti-encryption agenda is just despicable. Yeah. I mean, the second news story is kind of the same. It is. Um, but I was about to say that this, this, there's two things you have to remember. One is that this is a, a thing about how Amber Rudd's completely out of touch with everything. She thinks hashtags are a thing that can be hidden away. So she completely doesn't understand what hashtags are. So that, in a slightly more sinister way, she absolutely understands what all this is. Oh yeah, she's trying to obfuscate it. Yeah, you know, all yeah, that's using true. Using the internet. Yeah, the that's true. Hands of really ignorant people, like everybody that made a racist comment immediately after that. Mm. You know, totally. You know, just sort of like, oh, you see this terrorism thing? Well, encrypted communications or encrypted banking—that's what—that's what you're helping to to, to support. You're supporting terrorism by not telling us every last fucking thing you do. I mean, we're already in a, in a thing where they're pushing sex workers off um, social media, totally, and putting them into danger because they're. And this is all in support of this mythical Middle Englander that reads the Daily Mail that harumps into their paper and says, "Everything <laughs> different's got to get some fucking payback." We got all, you know, we got all these different people doing these things that I don't approve of, and I vote for the Tories. And, and you know, this is just this is just pandering to this this imaginary top ideal Tory that's not very well educated, that doesn't use the internet, and thinks that anybody that uses it is some kind of deviant, and that some anybody that deviates from their idea of normal is necessarily bad. That's why they always push sex workers and and collate it with. Um, Organized crime and terrorism and funding for you know mean evil people that will take away your children and then just put sex workers' lives in danger. This is this yeah. you know Middle Englander agenda where we don't want brown people doing stuff that we don't. We don't want anybody that's got maybe a fetish that we don't agree with or that you know, is going to be openly different or use the internet to communicate or have you know internet conversations with people. We're going to make those people live in fear. Fuck them. Mm -hmm. This this just makes me want to use every last bit of encryption that you possibly can and make. You know, if somebody's going to read my email, they've got they a fucking work for it. Yeah. Bastard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just like you know, Telegram is encrypted and stuff like that. Mm hmm. But, you know. It's, but it's like right then police in, yeah, this bit police in Germany knew Anis Amri was planning a suicide attack nine months before he drove a lorry into a packed Christmas market in Berlin, killing twelve, because they'd been able to access encrypted telegram messages. Then why the Jimmy Jack fuck didn't they stop him? Mm-hmm. Nine months. Yeah. They knew. This is when they've hacked through the encryption and gone, Oh, he's planning to do a bad thing. Doesn't that warrant driving up and saying, oi, fuck it, twitch wrong and we'll shoot you? Yeah. I mean, you really can't. You, you know nine months, I am planning a suicide attack. Well, we are planning to visit you, son of Jim. You know, then why not go round? If you know all that, well, unless it serves some sort of political purpose, that these suicide attacks are allowed to happen in a kind of like, let's let the Germans bomb Coventry kind of a way. Mm-hmm. Unless you've got a really fucking great reason not to step in. Nine months. I'd be angry if it was an hour. Yeah. We knew an hour before that this person was going to do something dodgy. When why didn't you fucking sort something then? You know, if you can't arrest him, why not turn up and knock on his door and sort of like say, we're paying attention. You sent this message. We decrypted it. But they didn't do shit. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Oh, and there's a quote from Boris Johnson. Now Boris Johnson can go fuck he himself. He's furious about the failure of the internet companies to block extremist material. Get fucked. Yep. Yeah. And it's just like, well, you know, well, you can't encrypt things. You should be able to read everything. Why? This is reading everything is not going to stop anything. In fact, if you get the access to read anything, you won't find shit. 
at the moment, because you've got to have a good reason to look into someone, and you've got to then decrypt their shit, you're, you're pretty sure before you start that they've done something wrong that needs to be prevented. Unless you're the German police and you're going to sit on your hands for nine months. But if you're going to block, if you're going to go after someone, then this is so they have blanket access. This is like scare tactics. Yeah. Yeah. What a bunch of horseshit. Just to whip up fear and sort of indignation and shit like that. It's like there's no way you could have prevented that attack. There's no way you could have stopped it. And in fact, you know, it, they say it in the beginning of that article, 82 seconds. That was the police response time from terrorists doing bad shit to terrorists on the ground. Yep. 82 seconds. That's pretty good. I can live with that. Uh, you know, you, there's, and there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. It's not like they tracked his entire personal history and he was buying Semtex on the black market and shit like that, and that's how he stepped in and stopped that. There's not even a pretense that they could stop it. This is just like a, we should be able to read everything, because terrorism. But even when well, you reading everything doesn't do shit. <laughs> exactly. Even when you've got nine months head start, you still can't put shit together in nine months. I am planning a suicide attack to kill lots of people. Then you need a fucking visit, Gov, didn't you? You know, because e even if all that achieves is that guy now is, like, contaminated as far as the terrorist cell system, they've got to set up something mm -hmm. else. But they're aware that his connections are being watched. Yeah. You know, you are a person of interest. We watched your email. You said you were going to do something. Um, and because we've got probable cause, we can now, you know, talk to you, or at least interview you. At least follow you around and get some proof. Nine months. If you can't put a case together in nine months, you know, you're your job. Exactly. If you gave me that heads up and gave me a picture of the guy in his address, I could probably do something on my own. <laughs> I'm reasonably sure my cat could probably do something in nine months. Yeah. Even if it's a continued plan to shit in his front garden for the next nine months. <laughs> in the shape of, you know, we know what you're doing. Yeah. It hurts, you know. It's like I, I'm fairly, I'm, I'm fairly sure that Coco the gorilla could come up with an idea, sign it, paint a picture about it, and record a new album about maybe stopping the terrorists in nine months. You know, you could probably train a pigeon to do something useful against that terrorist in nine months. That's fucking appalling. So we're talking about, we can't do anything in nine months, but we demand to read it because this terrorist sent something about 30 seconds before he did his attack. Yeah. We'll have to have a couple of fucking tablets. Anyway. There's some moral outrage for the Daily Mail in <laughs> the world. That is proper moral outrage. What bollocks. Yeah. We want to curtail your freedom to have conversations, so um, terrorism. Yeah. Terror. It's always... Always the um, excuse, yeah, isn't it? We don't bomb those countries, therefore they won't commit terrorist acts. Yep. Let's give them, you know, because, you know, the reason you can recruit in this country, if you're a terrorist organisation, is we have legitimately done bad shit in their countries. Mm-hmm. We've properly got, we haven't just sort of like, oh yes, we've manipulated their stock market to make things difficult. No, not nothing that sold. We actually flew planes over those countries and unloaded bombs. And we go, but they did bad things to us. Well, well, fucking yeah. <laughs> That's a bit of an outcome when you bomb somewhere's infrastructure flat. And then you say to people that have moved from that country, look what they did to us. Don't you think maybe one or two of those people are going to kick off? How about we not do the evil shit? <laughs> and we pay them a fair price for the oil and we help out with getting that region stable. And then they don't bomb us at all or attack us in any way. Exactly. We as well be mates. <laughs> it's only started. I mean, those people, you know, the people in charge of those countries have been despicable for a good 50 years. And it's only recently when they said, oh, and we might be turning off the oil supply. Then we went right in and bombed it, bombed it, bombed that shit down. And it's like, no. Yep. And you're surprised? You're actually surprised that people will do shit. It's like, you know, oh, the Irish did something after we, you know, divided their country. Mm hmm. What a shock. We should stop people using telephones because terrorism. And that talking in public, or maybe going to the pub where other people might have ideas going. Yep. 
stop doing evil shit, people will stop stop doing evil shit back. That's it's pretty simple. And it's not even like turn the other cheek, it's not even like the whole Jesus thing, it's like, you know, this is a tactical decision. Maybe we shouldn't bomb a shitload of civilians. Yeah. It's <laughs> schools and stuff and launch predator drones at weddings and things like that. Maybe we should stop doing that. Pretty much. Maybe we should just have a conversation along the lines of how about we stop bombing you and you stop bombing us? And we, we open up some sort of diplomatic channel. Because this is silly. Yeah. Because, you know, you know, no matter how many people these terrorist attacks killed, like it's like one a year. It's still nothing like the death toll in those countries that, that are recruiting these people. I know. It's not even close. It's, it's like the, the, the first Gulf War. 150,000 mm -hmm. Iraqi dead. American dead. 79. Mm -hmm. So it's like <laughs> massively asymmetric. You know, sort of like, you know, it's, it's still this, you know, sort of like, you know, maybe they can get one or two of them in a crowded city street. Yeah. But I'd like to know how many people died on the roads in the UK that day. How many road traffic accident victims there were, how many victims of domestic assault, how many, you know, that sort of thing, that died as a result. And I'm pretty sure you're, you're probably about as likely to be killed by your nearest and dearest in, in, on a particular day than you are by a terrorist with the current, yeah. with the current ratio. And this is all whipping up this, oh, now we must deport Muslims and shit like that. Mm -hmm. This is very similar to um, Hitler's run up to election. Yeah. You know, all sorts of incidents involving mm. Jews and how they own stuff. And they're very secretive and they only talk to other Jews and we must stop them, maybe get rid of them a bit. <laughs> oh man, it's like total fascism. Oh yeah. We must now be fascists. Why? Because it's easier to control all of you, and then we can stay in power. Like, oh dear, really? For four years more work? Get out of the job. I'm thinking, I, I really am going to try and, I'm going to enter a bit the, the next general election. I think that needs to, needs to happen. Especially now yeah. George Galloway is, is setting up office around the corner with the respect mm -hmm. of the country. You know, respect. But George, you're, you're a loony. You can't <laughs> And I think I'd get 5% of the vote just by not being George Galloway. Yeah. <laughs> What's your platform? Um, not being George Galloway. Really? Is that it? Well, and legalizing cannabis and decriminalizing prostitution and generally <laughs> being a much nicer human being and looking out for the poor and, and basically making sure companies can pay their fucking tax. Yeah. How about that? That's as a start. And I'm sure we can come up with more cool shit to do. Because it is the job of government to make everybody's lives a bit better year on year. Which they've been failing to do for 350 years. Let's talk yeah. about the Enclosure Act. Bastards. Right, okay, well, moving on. Rant over. Sorry. Uh, that sort of thing where it's sort of like, you know, bad things have happened so you have no freedom is bullshit. Yeah. Damn right. All it does is, is just going to make, you know, it's. It's, it's, yeah, you know, very few people are even using encryption. I mean, whenever I talk to anybody, uh, I go to talks and things like the um, Manchester bar camps and stuff like that. There's always someone going, "Please, for fuck's sake, just use encryption." If, if as many of us as possible use encryption, they will see how pointless it is. I exactly. Think, I think it's something that's time is coming. Now you've got things like Telegraph, but we need something a bit easier and, and more accessible. So if you're out there and you're very nerdy and you're thinking about something, don't think about what you and your geeky friends can use. Think about what something like I could use. Because I, I really don't do technology. You know, mm -hmm. I've got technology to do other things with, but I really don't do tech for tech's sake. You know, I want to do stuff with it. And think about that. Think about something that, you know, like Twitter. You know, that's really a piece of piss to you. Yeah. I, mean, I know Telegraph's quite easy, but you're sending messages to another person with Telegraph. So you need to think of a hook, a reason for people to use it. You know, like Facebook and stuff like that. Even though I hate Facebook, but you know, it's like that. You know, mm -hmm. as, as ubiquitous as YouTube or Facebook or email. You know, something that literally is just something that the people you know, the people you're sending the message to, can easily decrypt it, and the people that you know don't need a decrypted message can get that as well. Usually, like a really simple email. Address. 
or some shit yeah. like that, and then we can all use it. But when you have to install a little app and then link all your shit up via that, and that's you know, anything that you can't show your parents how to use is too complicated. Mm-hmm. You know, if you think you, you can show a five-year-old or somebody that doesn't really do technology, that's what we're talking about here. You need something that easy. And yeah. We'll all use it. And I'm right. Are. Okay, so moving on. Next news story is also thanks to Kevin. Those, basically, this whole show is thanks to Kevin, pretty much. Yes, it is, yeah. Kevin, the, today's show is brought to you by Kevin. Um, so, Dishwasher has directory traversal bug. Uh, Miel went full internet of things with a network connected dishwasher, gave it a web server, and now finds itself on the wrong end of a security bug report, and it's accused of ignoring the warning. I don't know why a dishwasher needs to be connected to the internet, but we will find out with news. The utterly predict- predictable vulnerability advisory for the full disclosure made in this detail. Um, AKA Media Professional PG8528 Web Server Directory Transversal. This is the built in web server that gives you to remotely control the glassware cleaning machine from a browser. What? Uh, okay, um, a little bit of my brain just died. Yeah. Why? 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 A button. How lazy can yeah. you be? You've got a dishwasher. Walk up to the fucker and switch it on. You've got to put stuff in the dishwasher, so, you know, why not? Yeah, I don't understand. I shall control it from home after loading up the dishwasher. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, if if you're talking to a robot that goes and gathers up all your glasses because you're too fucking lazy, then puts them in the dishwasher and starts it going, that might be doable. But why? Okay, so the corresponding embedded web server is typically listened to port 80 and is prone to directory traversal attacks and is therefore an unauthenticated attacker may be able to exploit this issue to access sensitive information created in subsequent attacks. And just do your glassware remotely, even when you don't want it to be washed. Just wash your dishes and, and just stick a middle finger up to you if you want dirty dishes. Um, proving it to yourself is simple using basic HTTP get fetch from whatever IP address the dishwasher has on your network to reveal the shadow password in its system. Wow. It's a bit like when, when I used to have to do um, tech support for a nuclear power station. Mm-hmm. And we had to watch it to see if they you know, they had guys that watched for incursions on the network and stuff like that. And it's like, why would, why? Why is there a nuclear power station on the internet? Any part of it? No. <laughs> Hire someone to pick up the phone and phone someone and say, I think there's a problem. Don't have it on the net, on the internet. You know, if you're looking after a nuclear power station, you're getting paid pretty well. Go the fuck in and, and press the button. Don't have yeah. it packable or network connected. No, not at all. Like, think Battlestar Galactica. There's no reason you have to have this shit plugged in or connected. Yeah. That's stupid. So, directory traversal attacks let miscreants, acts of miscreants, access directories and data they really shouldn't be able to read, such as sensitive configuration files and similar stuff. They are going to do your dishes extra shiny, you bastard. Um, this information can be exploited to potentially wrest control of the Atlas system. In other words, you can use this traversal vulnerability to gain a foothold to potentially hijack the machine and infect it with malware. But also, probably, mm-hmm. there's a way of getting back into that the user's router that it's connected to, and then onto machines that are on the, on the network, possibly. But it's a, it's a mm-hmm. problem. I've, I've managed to get access to systems on my own home router by going through the hardware and stuff like that. You can do it. If you've got access to yeah. the, the, net, the, base, the network connection spur, you can do other things. So if anything else is connected to it, then you can do it. But it's unclear which libraries or software components merely use to craft a web server in the dishwasher's firmware. The PG8528, which boasts remote service features and is designed for restaurants and bars, appears to be run in the form of embedded Linux. Without a fix from the vendor for a professional dishwasher, the best option is to make sure the appliance isn't exposed directly to the internet, or otherwise firewall it off from other devices. Or just ask yourself why the fucking Jimmy Jack bucket's actually connected to the internet in the first place. Yeah. Why? And because Melia is an appliance company, not a pure play IT company, it doesn't have a process for reporting or fixing security bugs. Yeah. <sighs> Jens Riegel of German company Schneider Wolf explains that Mueller never responded when he contacted the police with his findings, but the first contact was made in November 2015. And the note to appliance maker is to stop trying to connect stuff to networks, you're no good at it. 
Mm-hmm. The research you discovered above expressed that the vulnerable in the unit is not a household issue, but a commercial level washer and disinfectant. To our mind, that's as bad or if not well. I don't really care if a restaurant's too stupid to. <laughs> they can't have someone to just push a button. They, they, they probably deserve that. But yeah, anyway, another thing restaurant dishwashers are not dishwashers. They don't wash the dishes properly. It really pisses me off the way people think the dishwashers wash dishes. They don't, they sanitize dishes. Yeah. So basically, you've got to scrub all the hardcore shit off before you even put it in the dishwasher. And you, and if, if you're already doing that, you're standing at a sink. You're at the sink washing the dishes to go in the dishwasher. Yep. You know, it's like, yeah, I have to, that's, this is what I do for a job. I, I wash dishes. But I, the reason I am the only person that ever gets the dishes properly clean and everybody goes, wow, how do you manage it? It's because I essentially wash the shit before I put it in the dishwasher. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? You you wash, like, the majority of the crud off. It's, it doesn't matter too much if there's, like, a a little bit of it baked. Or this is my experience from, like, my own dishwasher. It doesn't matter if, if it's a little bit like, or if it's if it's kind of liquid, you know, if it's not like burnt on or anything, you're kind of okay. Or if you get like the what I found is it that dishwashers have a hard time with is when you've got thick layers of gunk. Yeah, that's when they have a hard time cleaning it all off. But even anything like dried on egg will defeat the dishwasher. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. You, you, if it's like you've got to like scrub most of it off, but if what oh, I say, what I found is that if you scrub like most of it off, if it's just left with like a little layer, a tiny layer of stuff that's like you're having a hard time scrubbing off, the dishwasher will generally get rid of that. Mm. But like the stuff that you can easily get rid of, the dishwasher will have a hard time with. It's that sort of thing. The way I look at it is, it's a thing that makes the hard parts of washing up easy. Yeah. And the easy parts of washing up, it can't do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you're up next with the next news story. Right. Yeah, it, it's daft. I mean, this whole Internet of Things thing is just stupid. I mean, the, the, I mean, okay, yeah. A, a fridge with, you know, a thing that you can order... Your groceries from? Yeah, that's yeah, a good idea. But you can do that. With a, I mean, oh, that's why I like the, app, a smartphone. the dash. The dash button. Yeah. Just order. You know, I mean, they. I think they give you a credit now if you have dash button. But things that you're going to order. I mean, but really, milk and bread and things like that. Mhm. Really, you can just pick up on your way home. Yeah. That shit's not going to turn up till the next day, so it's no good to you if you run out of milk. Mhm. I mean, what I'd like to do is, what I, I mean, you can set yourself an alarm, but I wish that mobile phones had an alarm that you could put in a bit of text to. Yeah. So, you, you say you set your alarm, say you finish, if you're, most people finish work at, say, five o'clock, just for argument's sake, neither of us do, but a lot of people. So, you set your alarm to the moment you walk out of work, and your alarm goes off, and it says, get milk. Pick up the milk. Oh, you can do that with, like, cal- you can do that with, like, calendar entries and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's easier to just do it than it is to order it automatically. Yeah. It's not like you press milk and then 20 minutes later somebody turns up at your door. I mean, delivery service isn't that good yet. See, that would work for me. You just put mm. the milk and bread button and test, you know, your local supermarket just goes, oh, this dude wants milk and bread, we'll just pop it round. Yeah. You know, all had like a sort of truck delivery service that had deliveries going on with just things simple things like brown bread, milk, sugar, tea. Yeah. And you didn't have a great deal of choice, but that shit was always on the truck. And you press the buttons and it would go, okay, you want milk, tea, sugar, coffee, or bread, or whatever. You know, and you don't get as much choice, but the truck is just roving around and they'll bring it to you for free within, say, half an hour on its round. Yeah. That could probably kind of work. But yeah, it's just sort of, you know, certain things I don't, I really don't see the point. Given that you can do online shopping anyway, and have a look around your kitchen and go, I need to follow them. Pick that up with online shopping, get it delivered the next day. It's just, it's, uh, perhaps I'm getting old, I'm turning into a commander. Certain technologies don't work for me that much. Anyway, moving on, new, next new story. I found this one. Oh, so yeah, um,. North Carolina set to pass compromise bathroom bill that still leaves trans people without a pot to piss in. 
And see, Republicans and Democrats have collaborated on a compromise version of HB2, the state's notorious job-killing, boycott-raising, and shamefully discriminatory bathroom bill. The compromise makes some cosmetic changes at the margins, but it's still a piece of shit that will embarrass a state on national stage and does not address any of the concerns raised by those who've announced boycotts of North Carolina, meaning it will cost the state billions. In plain English, no local body could allow transgender people to use the bathroom of the gender they identify with. Uh, they would have to follow state law and use the bathroom of the gender listed on their birth certificate. Local governments are also not allowed to pass LGBT rights laws in a, in the, in a state that has no protections for LGBT people. This is discrimination, pure and simple, and makes LGBT people second-class citizens. It's telling that the provisions extend until December 2020, after the next two national elections and the next governor's race. The compromise is designed to appease the NCAA, which is the North Carolina Athletics Association, which is designing, deciding whether to hold the championships. Uh, actually, that might not be the North Carolina Athletics Association. I think it might be... Um, the National Center for Athletics or something. It doesn't say in this. Um, National College Aid Athletics Association. Um, yeah. It's designed to appease them, which is deciding where to hold championships through to 2022. If this new bill passes, HB 142, uh, the NCAA should laugh and say, nice try. I, again, this is oh, this panic about trans people. I was like, no, it was like, why? Mhm. Mm no matter what bit someone's got or not, if they're in a stall using a leaf, I, I just, I just don't get this like mad. And I'm all for like, where were we? We were in somewhere, and it was just perfect. It was just, instead of like men's and women, it was just like six loos. Each loo was an individual loo, like a, like an individual little room with a wash basin and a loo. And it had no gender. It just said toilet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all it said. You walked in, you did your business, you came out. And there were six of them on this one floor in the building. And it was fucking yep. magic. And I, unfortunately, it was at an event or something that we went to. Mm -hmm. And we went, I went in, and I just thought, this is magic. This is like, this totally robs the issue of any credence at all. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't know, I, and there wasn't anybody around. I could tell that this was the best, most wonderful set of bathrooms that I'd ever seen in my life. That totally yeah. sidestepped the entire issue and just went, no, we've got to get past. We can see the changes coming. It's a bit like, you know, trans people, you know, you're not going to get to bottle trans. It doesn't matter what you do. It's a bit like saying we're going to make homosexuality illegal again, or we're going to make, we're going to reintroduce apartheid. It's not going to fucking work. Yeah. People won't stand for it. You know, you don't get to do this anymore. It's a bit like you don't get to put racist comedies on TV anymore. You don't get to put sexist comedies on. You don't get to, you know, you don't get to do it anymore. We've moved on. And no amount of dicking around and, and being arseholes about it is going to change. Mm -hmm. The light has been switched on. <laughs> and we've smashed the light switch. You don't get to churn it off again. You know, the internet's here now and we're going we're gonna to pay attention and shame you every time you even think of this shit. Yeah. Okay, and this is our final story for today. Um, in some states you can't read the law without paying a corporation. Thanks again to Kev. If you want to read the official laws of, of the state of Georgia, it will cost you a thousand dollars. Yeah, taking a leaf out of the, the Catholic book. Um, open Records activist Carl Malamud bought a hard copy and it cost him one thousand two hundred and seven dollars and two cents after shipping and taxes. A copy on CD was one thousand two hundred and fifty nine dollars forty one cents. Um, the good news for Georgia residents is that they'll only have to pay three hundred eighty five dollars and ninety four cents to buy a printed set. From Lexis Malamud thinks reading the law shouldn't cost anything, so a few years back he scanned a copy of the state's official law, known as the Official Code of Georgia Annotated at the um, Malamud made the USB drive with two copies on them. 
one scan copy and another encoded in XML format. And on May 30th, 2013, he sent the USB drive to the Georgia School for the House, David Rolson, and the state's legislative council, as well as other prominent Georgia lawyers and policy makers. Access to the law is a fundamental aspect of our system of democracy, an essential element of due process, equal protection and access to justice, he said in the enclosed letter. The law, he reminded them, isn't copyrighted. The envelopes themselves announced Malmö's belief in the strength of his argument. Unimpeachable read the fruit adorned stickers surrounding, surrounded by American flags. Code is law, they continued. That phrase being the first words that appear in the well-known book by Harvard law professor Lawrence Lessig. Georgia lawmakers' response to Malamud's gifts was anything but peachy. Your unlawful copying infringes the exclusive copyright of the state of Georgia, read the response letter written by Chairman of Georgia Code Revision Commission, Josh McQueen. Accordingly, you hereby notice the cease and desist all copyright infringement. McQueen told Malamud to stop copying, destroy his files, and remove the laws off from his website. If he didn't reply within 10 days, they would file a lawsuit to force his hand and promise to seek damages for willful infringement. There was an unannotated copy of state law available for free on the state's website, McQueen reminded him, and that would have to, dis- have to suffice. More on that free copy in the So Public Resource Org sent the annotated code to Georgia's legislators and lawyers. Stickers on the envelope read, unimpeachable, copy that code, law is law. Um, Malamud had spent years freeing up vast amounts of public documents like state laws, court decisions and building codes. If you've ever looked at any company's SEC filing throughout the legal system, you have Malamud to thank for. In Georgia's view, there were two separate work- works at issue, the actual text of the laws which were available to the public and the annotations which were copyright and owned by the state. The annotated code includes things like judicial decisions uh, related to particular sections and includes these those extra notes of value-added material created by Lexus Nexus, the state's chosen sorry, the name of the page, publisher and thus subject to copyright. Materials made by the US federal government can't be copyrighted, but the state can hold copyright and state contractors can make copyrighted work. To Malamud, though, it was a faulty distinction. The OCGA is only the only official copy of Georgia's law, so that, that was the one that citizens needed to be able to read. Any lawyer would ignore this, pub- this publication and any of the components of his or her peril, he wrote in his response. No matter how you slice it, the two will look the same. The official code of Georgia annotated every component of it is the official law. Our publication of the official code of Georgia annotated should be encouraged, not threatened. So yeah, so if you want to read all the interpretations and all and everything the way Georgia runs its laws, you have to pay a fee. Well, that's ridiculous. Um, sorry, there's a lot of this that's just sort of filler and proof, which will be on the run. Um, so, for now, Georgia's laws have been removed from publicresource.org and replaced with a notification that your access to this document, which is the law of the United States of America, has been temporarily disabled while we fight for your right to read and speak the laws by which we choose to govern ourselves in a democratic society. To apply for license to read this law, please consult the Code of Federal Re- Regulations or applicable state laws and regulations with the name and address of a vendor. You may buy the law if you need to read it. Fuck off. <coughs> um, who paid for the law to be actually written down? That would be the taxpayer. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of like, well, who paid your wages, bitch? That's fucking mad. Yeah. It's, a fal- it's a false industry. That's just really insane. It's sort of like, you know, what, what do you mean you don't get to access it without paying a whole shitload of money? <coughs> anyway, so, yes. Now calm your outrage. <laughs> and we're going to go into some half time music now. Um, we've got Blood Moon by Luda Twin from the album Night Tide, courtesy of Shameless Promotion, who send us all our music. It's quite good, I've already listened to it. But that sounds really dismissive, doesn't it? It's quite good, I've already listened to it. I liked it because <laughs> this was the track I picked this week to put it on there. So have a listen and uh, possibly buy the album or at least look into the other bands and stuff like that. Because it's nice of them to just let us all, you know, put it out there. And yeah. um, after the break, we're going to do a discussion about vinyl and stuff like that. It's very much linked into our uh, media. Hell yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll be back after this um, artistic message.
We are Jeremy back, I'm ready. Bad Moon by Luna Twin from Night Side. And the outro music is another another track from the same music. <clears throat> so yeah, um, so we're going to talk about something that might completely disinterest you. But it's, uh, yeah, we both started sort of collecting vinyl. Yeah. Yeah. I like vinyl records. Um, and it's, it's real, real strange. I mean, I've learned a lot. It's... I'm probably still financially ahead from the learning experience, but I now I do now have five records. Oh, well, actually, I think I've got more. Oh, that's bad. I've got seven record players. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Let me break it down for you, though, because there's reasons for all of them. It's not just like I just you know the magic number of record players. Right, so I first started, I bought um, a steeple tone portable record deck because I wanted to take it to the radio studio. I didn't want to dick around with cartridges and stuff like that. Um, and I wanted to be able to play some actual vinyl because it's a fun thing to do on the radio. And we could mix it into the sound desk. And I also wanted to, yeah. to listen to the records ahead of time. However, those little portable, you know the ones that come in little suitcases and stuff? Mm -hmm. Oh, really shit. They are so shit. For a couple of reasons. One, the built-in you can plug it into an amplifier, and you get sort of an okay sound. Um, mm -hmm. It's not actually a very good stylus on it, for one, and it will destroy your records because that stylus is weighted far too heavy to make sure it doesn't skip. So in order to give it skip resistance, the manufacturers make the arm much heavier than it should be. So essentially, it will destroy your records over time. Exactly. Maybe yeah. a dozen planes, and you'll notice a, a destruction of the vinyl because the needle's so heavy, it's actually carving its way round the record rather than sitting in the groove and moving from side to side like it's supposed to to pick up yeah. the music. Much like a sound wave. If you look at a, like, if you ever used like audio editing software, um, the, the little lines move up and down as the sound goes on, and you get like a like a, a resistance amount that gives you the tone and pitch of the sound. And it moves along and does that. So, like a mm -hmm. sort of like you know, like you see the uh, like any sort of oscilloscope, it goes up and down, and then your the, the amplifier makes sense of that and gives you the music. But if the needle's too heavy, it start destroying that the fine sort of quality of the sound. Yeah, and it'll eventually fuck up your record. So, if you're buying music you like, it's destroying your investment in being able to listen to it multiple times or as often as you want. Um, also, the build quality is kind of shocking. So there's already problems with that steeple tone, and I haven't really used it much. And sort of like, like the connectors on the back have started to fuck out, and the dry solder joints, and basically it's kind of knackered. Yep. So then I decided I wanted something better, so I bought an ion USB turntable so I could actually output 
the music to my laptop and then record it so I could have a vinyl a recording of vinyl to take that in to the radio station and convert it to electronic format so I could put it in the phone. Which worked okay, but again it's still cursed with the shit movie and stuff like that. And it's it's not brilliant. And then I bought a couple of um, sort of DJ decks because I thought it would be a better quality of deck and to, to be honest, they were much cheaper than either of the other two. <laughs> way way cheaper and way way better for my records and a much better sound and I got two for 25 quid um, yep. but and I'd spent over a hundred pounds on the ion USB thing which isn't much more than a USB pickup so to be quite honest you could use the you could just use an ordinary record deck and play it into the same software and still separate out all the tracks so, yep. you know, so it's like I wanted better quality sound, but I also was thinking maybe I could learn to sort of like DJ a bit and be able to swap over things, and it's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. And then I bought the replacement bits to get that working, which involved buying another record deck to get counterweights for them because they didn't come with that. And I got that replacement record deck for like 45 quid. And I bought a mixer, which acts as a preamp, because one thing they don't tell you about record platform, this DJ decks is that they need a preamp before they work, which is typically built into the mixer, like a DJ mixer. So if you're looking mm -hmm. for a cheap preamp, buy yourself a second-hand DJ mixer and it gives you all sorts of other fun funky controls and then run them to amplified speed. Then it works. And uh, then recently I was, I was in a local pawn shop, essentially, and I spotted two much better belt uh, um, direct drive turntables, which for DJ mixing is way better than belt drive because the torque mm -hmm. so you can actually spin up the, bit, the, the, the discs a lot quicker and, and actually get them to you know, join up a lot more so there's no gap between records which there would be with the belt drive and uh, yeah so, so now I've got seven which is embarrassing but the two that I've got now are awesome they really are good I'm very very happy but yeah that's my record deck story but the actual collecting vinyl record I mean what's your, what's your take on it? Oh, I've got um, I've got similar decks to well, I don't know about the ones I've got now, but mine are kind of a bit like these, um, and I've got a DJ mixer in the middle of them as well. But my DJ mixer is not fantastic, so I need replacing at some point. And I, the reason I I got into collecting vinyl was for for DJing, specifically for DJing. I wanted to learn how to DJ properly using vinyl. Unfortunately, my technology is letting me down and making it a lot more difficult. Um, well, so I need to weird, mix is very weird. It's not great. I'm have to replace it at some point with a better one. Um, so I'll look for another second hand one at some point. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I got mine. I've got a little sound lab one, but it's it's pretty primitive. It doesn't have many features, but it, it seems to be. Well, yeah, well, I'll I'll have I'll have to look around. But yeah, uh, the reason I got it was for um, to learn how to DJ mixing. So I bought like a job lot of. Uh, 12 inch singles from eBay and didn't really think about it too much after getting those and then speaking to V recently kind of got back into it and there's just something about having vo listening stuff on vinyl that's different to listening stuff on a computer probably in the same way and it, it might just be a nostalgia but I don't think so for me because I never really experienced vinyl growing up. Vinyl is a relatively new thing to me. By the time when I was young, um, in the when I started, well, sorry, when I started appreciating music, which was in the late eighties, everything was on compact disc and audio cassette. I wasn't using. I never really used or listened to anything on vinyl until I got much older. And even then, when I did hear stuff that was on vinyl as a kid, I wasn't allowed to do anything with it because of that taboo of touching vinyl. You're not allowed to touch vinyl. can't touch it. Make sure you don't scratch it or anything like that. Those sort of things. Um... So I, I only it's only very recently that I've started playing with it, and I've got a 
renew I've got an appreciation for it now. Uh to the point where I'm now starting to think about maybe well the last time I went out with Vita Manchester we went and had a look around the uh, vinyl stores and that was really good. Really enjoyed that. Well, now I'm trying to a find over served in Manchester. I think I yeah. I'm, I'm up to nine record stores in the city centre. I mean I haven't really gone any further afield like Salford or anywhere like that. I haven't gone into the outskirts. But actual yeah. places that just sell vinyl, there's nine. There's like two here in Leeds that I know of. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, you've got. I mean, a lot of the major retailers are starting. I mean, HMV. I'm not counting stores that that are sort of mainline. So I'm not counting the HMV or anything like that. So it's probably more like ten places that you could actually buy vinyl. And I don't really buy new vinyl very often. I think I've only bought about half a dozen brand new records. Mm -hmm. that I've been collecting vinyl over the last couple of years. I mean, there are a lot of people that spend like an enormous amount of money on records. There are people that collect it so that it's in pristine condition. But one of the things I like about vinyl, it's kind of got more longevity than CDs. Yeah. No, I'd agree with that. I mean... Very, very old records. one by um, Peter and Gordon, which was 1964. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what, 55 years old, 53 years old this year. That, that's the actual record. Not it was recorded in 1964, the, the actual record was pressed. The one that I have was pressed in 1964. So, yeah. you know, um, what's that, seven years before I was born. About that, yeah. So the record is much older than I am, but it still plays perfectly. Mm -hmm. Whereas, if you put, if, you know, I, I'm not sure a CD would still play. The CDs do degenerate over time. They do, unfortunately. They actually rock. Whereas this record, this piece of plastic, is still running, and I can still play it and still listen to it, and occasionally clean it, and it's fine. I mean, there is yeah. that thing with, you know, you mustn't scratch the record. Well, if you put the vinyl on, you step back and you just play it, there's no way you can scratch the record. Really. Exactly. I know there are pots and buzzes and stuff like that, but generally that can be removed if you actually clean the record. And you can do that with your soapy water or windily. Yeah. Or any other window cleaner, any kind of sort of like isopropyl alcohol based cleaner that's a, low, a fairly low solution. So something that's mm -hmm. essentially. The idea behind it is that you spray it on, you wipe it in. And it has to have enough alcohol in so that it actually evaporates. Because you can't play a wet record. Important safety tip, guys. You can't play a wet record. <laughs> no. And it, it, for the weirdest reason, is that because the, the needle is moving through and it's, it's making friction or contact with the actual brew, it will actually boil the water and warp the indentation. Yep. So you'll actually cause tiny, tiny amounts of steam to be formed on a, on a very tough, very small. But you'd have to watch it through an electron microscope to see it do. It. But you, you, mm -hmm. can, you can clean it with anything that's not too um, sort of acidic or sort of like going to burn holes in, it, but that will evaporate on its own over time. Yeah. And they just seem to have more long. They just seem to last longer. And it, there's no moving parts. Mm -hmm. You know, it's literally a single piece of plastic. You know, with a groove. And the variety, and it's like all the music ever. I've, I think I've got music in nearly every genre except hip hop. We'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. um, I've got some jazz, I've got funk, I've got punk, I've got rock and roll, I've got musicals, I've got, you know, all sorts of, you know, 80s pop and, sort of, you know, 60s pop and stuff like that. I love the Peter and Gordon one because it's um, Paul McCartney's first song credit. Yeah. And I've got, I, I like firsts, I like things that were, were out first. I bought um, the other day, and for 25p, and if you are shopping for records and, and you're looking for a particular genre that's pretty old, and owned by people that have bought it when they're in their sort of, sort of uh, 40s and 50s and 60s, they tend to really look after their records. But I've got this, um, when stereo first became a thing, they had a stereo cryout record, so people could because mm -hmm. most of people's record collection would be in mono, 
when they bought yeah. the stereo record thing. They had a demonstration disc of stereo, and I found one. I thought it was called uh, Breakthrough or something like that. And okay. It was designed to show. Um, <laughs> it's designed to show the wonders of stereo. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just amazing to me. Um, and it's got all sorts of just snippets of, of famous bits of classical music and modern music and things like that, or modern for the 1950s. And it's yeah. this wonderful reproduction of 633 Squadron. <laughs> Magic. And I just thought, oh, that's got. And that was 25 pence. Oh, wow. Like the Peter and Gordon record was 25 p. Yeah. And, you know, that's. And when we were out shopping together, I bought a few records that I actually would have been looking for in bargain bins. And, you know, there are people that only buy new records, and it must cost them an absolute fortune. No, oh, it must do. Whereas I've got a few hundred records, and I don't think I've spent more than about 150 quid on records. Mm -hmm. Maybe. That's, that's about it. That's in two years. So it's, it's a really cheap hobby. I'll go record shopping once or twice a month, and I, my typical spend is when it's in yeah. And I'll get like a bag full of records. Loads of record stores have pound bins or discount bins and stuff like that. A lot of the ones in Manchester. I mean, I, I get given some records free because I bought another record. You know, just, you know, you just buy. I, I tend to buy what takes my fancy, and it's just. It's, it, you can, it's a really exciting thing to sort of look. Even if you have no idea what the record is. You get home and you've got this sort of weird sound adventure. You're like, I have no idea what this sounds like. And generally speaking, I'm pleasantly surprised. Perhaps I'm just easy to clean. <laughs> but I love coloured vinyl as well. I'm just really, it's, you know, there's my next new record purchase is the, um, the Manchester one of the Manchester record shops is bringing out its own punk compilation of Manchester punk bands from the 70s. And they're bringing that out with its own little fanzine, which is the run reader. And it's on translucent green vinyl, which will be a mystical experience. And I don't know what I'm going to do, because I'm, I'm working that day, but I'm going into Manchester early just to go to the record store to buy it on its day of release. Nice. And I'll have to wait till like midnight that day before I can put it on the deck. Yeah. But I, was doing, I did an interview with the BBC for... Um, at this record shop, and they gave me a promo copy of the album and CD. It wasn't nearly as much fun to listen to, but it was good to get out exactly what stuff was going on. Yeah. But it's just incredible. It's a really, really interesting thing to get into, and you can do it for next to nothing. Mm. Oh, yeah. The two record decks that I'm really, really happy with were 60 quid for the pair. You know, that's nothing, and I already had an amplifier. But I've been looking around. You can buy an amplifier that will work for less than a tenner mm -hmm. on eBay. New, less than a tenner. Um, you would, if you use the DJ bit, you need a phono preamp or a, a preamp stage. But that would just be like you could just get a cheap mixer, and as long as it actually works, it will do the preamping for you. Exactly. So you could spend, you know, on your stereo, and my speakers that I'm using, this is embarrassing, I've got these really nice Sony bookshelf size speakers, and they sound really nice, and they were seven quid. Nice. In a pawn shop. So you really can just put together a really cheap stereo system. I would go, I would recommend a DJ deck, even if you can only get one, because all DJ decks will always have a counter weight, and that mm -hmm. will allow you to adjust the weight of the weight. And you might need to buy a cartridge, but you can get those for about 10 15 quid, depending on where you shop at. Sometimes the DJ deck will come with the counterweight and the cartridge head and the style, which is yeah. great. But yeah, and just like make sure it's got a detachable stylus head and a counterweight that you can remove. Definitely, those are the two things you should definitely look for. And if you plan to be DJ, it's probably a good idea to get record decks that are exactly the same. Get the decks that are the same, make sure that they've got enough torque. The best way to find out is if they've got enough torque, is ask to see them working, start it playing, and then put your fingers very lightly on the slip mat. If you put your fingers lightly on the slip mat, and the turntable continues to move... Well, the platter continues to move. The platter, sorry, continues to move underneath the slip mat. Mm. 
you're generally on for a good one. Yeah. And I don't mean... It, it's got to be moving at the same speed. Yeah. You, you applying pressure to it, the friction between the slip mat and the platter should not cause the platter to slow down. If it causes it to slow down at all, it's no good. No, don't bother. You want it to retain its speed despite you putting your fingers on it. That does depend on your lightness of touch. It needs to be a very, very light touch. It depends again on the talk. It, it can be if it's you can get away with a light touch on turntables that um, um that I've got a little bit of talk. That's a way of getting around it. But uh, for example, I was in Maplin um, on Saturday and encountered uh, they've got some turntables there that don't require a light touch. They've got really high torque. Nice. So they're going to be my, probably my next set of turntables, but they're like brand new. And they're like, uh, new marks. Oh, right, yeah. They're used by a lot of these, right? They're about uh, 140 quid each. Hmm. So they're expensive, brand you know, brand new ones. But the amount of torque they had was phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with mine. I've, I've managed to get to a point where I can touch the slip mat and stop it without the fact mm -hmm. of slowing down at all. But it does yep. require kind of a light touch. If you then, yep. you can then sort of hold on, you know, or you can sort of hold on to the record itself, like the edge of the record. Another thing they don't teach you. More coming on that. I, I intend to do a video about that, about yep. the whole, what to look for in the turntable. But yeah, I mean, but most direct drive turntables are going to be okay, but you might have to learn to touch it really well in order to stop the record from going out. And that's important to, to queue up a next record. Even if you're just going to play one record into another, there's not much thought for matching the actual beat of the record. You need to be able to start it at the start of the record. And vinyl works when there's always a lead in. So it's not like you can play a record and then set one up and make and, and crossfade it because it sounds really abrupt. Mm -hmm. So the idea is sort of the, 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 the listening experience is kind of smooth for the person that's listening. To it. DJ, exactly. it's something you do for other people. Well, it's kind of fun yeah. to actually just do it on your own. Just it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's fun to do it on your own, but the, the audience experience is great. But, you know, just vinyl, it, it's also one of the things I wanted to say is it's more of an event to put on a record. If you put on a CD, you, you sort of go away and do other things. <laughs> so you're not yeah, really no. actively listening to it, whereas when you put on vinyl, you kind of sit down and sort of properly listen to it in the order that the tracks are played. Yep. Um, oh, bring us to the subject of target now. If you are DJ and you put on an LP which has got multiple tracks on, the target light's there to kind of like highlight where the gaps in the track are. So you can mm, the, the, the track you're after that you want to play next. Yeah, it shines across the surface of the... Yeah. of the... It look straight down onto the deck. Sort of like yep. Where it is. And that's why DJs have two decks. So while you're while you're while well, one track's playing out, you're already queuing up the next one and making sure that's ready. Exactly. So if you're playing, if you if you're DJing 45, so it's seven inch 45, um, you've only got like two minutes or so to get everything queued up to the very start of the song. Mm -hmm. But it's it, it's an interesting and fun thing to do. And uh, a, a DJ deck. Even if you've just bought a DJ deck and some means of amplifying it, just so you can listen to vinyl because you wanted to listen to the music, which is a, also a fine thing to do, and I do, I, I get down and listen to my records a lot these days. Yeah. Um, and a, a single DJ deck is going to be better than, you know, dollar for dollar or pound for pound is going to be better than a similarly priced record deck made by someone yeah. that doesn't have a counterweight, doesn't have a change in the stylus or cartridge. Uh, you know, they're just a, they just seem to be better build quality. Even the cheap end ones, even my sound labs, um, belt drive turntables were better quality and, and they were like £12.50 each. Mm -hmm. That was still a better quality deck than the 100, and 100 or so pounds I spent on the Ion turntable. Which is an entry level hi fi turntable. But that's garbage next to even the cheapest DJ. Yep. Because they're built with different tolerances in mind. So if you're ever going to do it, the, the downside is you need a phono stand. You need some yep. amplifying the phono signal before it goes to an amplifier. Unless your amplifier has a built in phono station, some of them do. Some of them will specifically have phono as an input. 
Um, otherwise, it would be far too quiet. We'd have to either crank it up to full volume, it wouldn't be that loud. And, and shop around in, in pawn shops and places like, you know, I don't really want to name them, places like Ashton Day. Yeah. Where it's just the most instant, or C CEX doesn't really do record decks. So it's cash no. or, or cash generator, places like that, that are essentially pawn shops that you can buy something and stuff in. And have a look in there and see if there's, uh, and if you, any, if you look at like a really old turntable, like a 1970s turntable, generally speaking, you might have to replace the stylus. So mm -hmm. before you buy it, have a look at it and see if it's got a completely removable cartridge. You know, because you get what's called a head shell, which is the sort of framework for mounting the cartridge on. And that's a universal connector. So that plugs in, and then you use the four little wires that come off the head shell to connect to the back of the cartridge. And that means you can buy pretty much any cartridge, as long as you've got a head shell. So you'll know what it is. It's basically, right next to where the needle is, there's a little screw connector. And if you can unscrew the whole of the cartridge, that means you can put any other cartridge on. Yeah. So even if that cartridge is knackered, you don't need the specific brand normally or specific brand cartridge. You can get what you want, which means that you can, you know, save a bit of money to start with and get a much cheaper cartridge. But if it doesn't have that cartridge head at all, that's not a problem because you can connect another one. But what it mm -hmm. must have, absolutely must, from personal experience, and it was a major hassle, it must have a counterweight. Definitely. Because sometimes the counterweights are missing they detach and if it doesn't have a counterweight walk away there's no easy way of making a counterweight for a turntable because it's yep. specifically designed for the arm the tone arm the bit that holds the needle specifically designed for that and the tone arms are of different sort of circumferences and if you haven't got the right one you're kind of screwed because i i spent months looking for a replacement counterweight for the sound bag one Fortunately, I had a, I had a reference Technics turntable, and it just happens to be the same size of tone. So you've got a Technics like counterweight on a Sound Lab um, tone arm, and vice versa. But those are the only two that I found that are similar. Yeah. So be warned if it doesn't have the counterweight on it, and it looks like it's just, you'll know that it's designed to have a counterweight because instead of just an arm on a piece of plastic. There will be a little dial next to the tone, next to the start of the tone arm, called the anti skate. If it's got an anti skate mm -hmm. on it, it does have a tone arm. It does, it should have a counterweight. And if it hasn't got a big sort of solid removable counterweight on the back, walk away because it's more hassle than it's worth to try and sort. Definitely. So I... Even an entry level, a really cheap DJ one, is going to be better than a, a cheap turntable made for just for listening to records. Definitely so, agree with that. Go. For even if you can only get one, or even if you only intend to have one, but you get two, that's a whole deck's worth of spare parts. Yep. If they come as a pair, but they're really cheap, like the ones I got for 60 quid, so it's like $70, which is stupidly cheap, and these, they're lovely. You know, they're worth getting. And even if I had, had had to replace the styluses on them completely, or the, the cartridges, even if that was a shot, it was still an absolute bargain. But fortunately, they're really good cartridges. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so the equipment is kind of important. I will be bringing out a video based on that, and I'll probably bore you to death if you're not interested. But just the variety of music you can pick up for nothing in charity shops, thrift stores, everywhere. There's loads, loads of old vinyl, and uh, you know, it, 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 it's worth looking through crates to find interesting stuff. I mean, find you know, there's nothing stopping you from just listening to any music that you want in the world. For free, right now, you can just go on YouTube and it will be there. There's nothing to stop you doing that. But the, the fun thing about vinyl is the historical thing that you're holding, the actual thing that was pressed out when this record was, you know, first made. You're literally holding the very thing that was that the recording was made for. So I've got some I've got some really ancient tracks, and I like historically interesting tracks, um, records like. Uh, yeah, that, that sort of breakthrough record to, to demonstrate stereo. That would have been possibly many people's first experience listening to stereo. I've got um, the first single that was played on Radio 1, which was the first um, pop music station in the UK. 
which was Flowers and Rain by the Moon, which is a great mm-hmm. you know, it's really, really uplifting and, and, and poppy, but it's of its time. But this was one that we made at the time that Radio 1 started. I've got um, Video Killed the Radio Star with a 45 uh, 7 inch single because it was the first track played on MTV. You know, it's just that's, I like to collect unusual weird stuff and it's, it's worth doing. And if you're as old as I am, you remember it coming out on Vine and you tend to pick up the stuff that you liked when you were a teenager. But yeah, it's fun. And the DJing thing is fun and we'll be doing a few videos on that. Well, I'm drag rapping over here and we'll shoot some footage of us failing to be excellent DJs but having a lot of fun nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah, so that's all we've got to say about that. It's that fun. But well, I'll probably say lots more about it. But that's mm-hmm. fine in a nutshell and why you might collect it. I don't ever intend to be the sort of collector that buys 20 brand new records a month at 20 quid each. I'm never going to get that obsessed by it. But I do have like a collection of, of 1,500 albums and well over 100 singles. So you be the judge. And most of those I've picked up for less than a pound. But I've had a lot of fun listening to them. So yeah, go listen to some vinyl. Or find, find an obsessive friend that wants to get into it. But it's more of an experience to sit down and listen to music. It definitely is. Anyway, on to links and recomedia. And we ain't got shit this week for you, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, Kevin did send us a link, and that will be on the running order for um, Open VPN. There's an Open VPN project where you can produce your own virtual private network, which I'm still not entirely sure what it does. What is, what is a virtual private network? Uh, it creates a. It allows you to connect to a different network as though you were actually physically there. Right. So, is that if you had a machine running a VPN in your house, say? So, say you've got a, v, you've got a machine running a VPN server in your house, right? And you're somewhere else. You're across the country. But you've got internet connection. You can use a VPN client to connect to your home, your home network, and it is as though. You're at home. All right. So if you wanted to access the um, your network storage, yeah, that's what it would be for, or uh, an IP channel, something like that. Exactly. You could do that. It's like it allows you to access the network, the the private network, which is your own home network, externally, as if you're there physically. That's what a VPN does. Very. Cool. Um, it, uh, businesses use it to. Uh, for access it for allowing people to access data when they're working from home. So if I connected my, say I hooked up a Raspberry Pi with a VPN network on it, and I had a USB hard drive attached to that, I could look at my own data from anywhere in the world. Yeah. I just thought I'd, I'd, and you, I you wouldn't have to put clarify it. it. It's just that it's, it's you wouldn't need to make it publicly available either. That's the other thing you can make. You can just have it privately. Hence the private. Yeah. So that's a link, and that's up and coming. I'm sure um, Kevin's going to let us know as soon as that's a really super thing because he'll probably need to set them up. And if I can set yeah. up, then anybody can. Maybe we should do that. Maybe we should see <laughs> whether it's even possible to do that. I've got some time left. I might have a play with it. And, and uh, for Recomedia, oh, we're yeah. going to recommend to something that V turned me on to a couple of days ago, The Get Down on Netflix. Oh, it's awesome. Beautiful series. Beautiful like series of like a... F- for music. Yeah. It's like a fictional story reg- around the actual birth of hip-hop. Hmm. It's, it's beautiful. And it's got some, some of the actual figures. Like, yep. Um, cool DJ Cool Herc, Grandmaster Flash. Yeah. But it's very much fictionalised, but it is awesome. It is, it is absolutely brilliant. And along with it, they've got um, what's it called? What was the documentary that went that, that, that more or less goes? Hip Hop Evolution. Hip Hop Evolution, and that's really good as well. And I, I, I like hip hop more now. I understand it a lot more, and I understand the cultural setting. And it, there's a, there seems to be, for me, there's a direct line with people like The Last Poets and um, Gil Scott Heron. 
who were mm-hmm. basically allied with the Black Panthers. And there seems to, there's almost a direct sort of lineage from that, which is really very angry music and justifiably so, but really good to listen to. Yeah, go and listen to some Gil, Gil Scott Heron on YouTube and some Lars Poet. Bloody excellent. Mm-hmm. And, and that segues, you know, and then immediately listen to um, what was that? Uh, Apache. Oh, Apache by um, uh, Sugar Hill Gang. Apache, jump on it. Yeah, is an amazing record, and there's you can hear its ancestry from the sort of like 1960s radicalized black um, civil rights movement to that. You can hear it. Yeah, you can hear it. In so if you've heard, yeah, sorry, if you've heard the, um, if you've heard the track Rapture by Blondie. That's about the 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 fledgling hip hop industry. Yeah, Blondie really broke a lot of music. Mm. The, you know, so first rap, first hip hop, to sort of make it into the mainstream. Well, that had been going on for years before that happened. Yeah, they they brought it to the they brought it to the white man. <laughs> yeah, and I I don't think the white man was listening. No, particularly. Um, Go back and listen to the people that actually made that music. You know, so I mean, so people like Public Enemy and, and um, sort of bands of that ilk that did scratch mixing in their tracks and break beats and things like that. It's just yeah. phenomenal. And then if you um, basically the, the, the other wonderful thing about um, the Get Down is they more or less show you how it works. And it yeah, you kind of get like mini lessons of using. A turntable as an instrument. Mm-hmm. In in an era when people could get hold of turntables, but synthesizers and um, mixes and uh, what do you call it, uh, sound sequences, yeah, hadn't even been invented yet. So you couldn't lay one bit of music over another without being, you know, dexterous enough and um, so knowledgeable about the track you're playing that you can actually do it. Mm-hmm. And like all DJ, it requires you to know the records that you're playing. Yep. So it, it, it is really interesting. And that's one of the things that Mixing on Vinyl has over something like Virtual DJ. Because you have to know the music. And, you know, there is a, a certain element of skill involved in sorting all that out. Exactly. Um, my other recommendation for this week is, is kind of phone apps. Um, we were talking the other day, and, and I, noticed, I noticed that Graphic didn't have a couple of these apps that he's since downloaded. And um, these are apps that would actually help you out, you know. Um, you know, so, so I would recommend we've got to wrap this up because we've got stuff to do. Um, so I recommend Osman, which is open street map for Android, which is an offline GPS mapping system. It's really good. I've tried that out. Really like and it. If you've ever seen a Garmin, a really good GPS system for hiking or driving, like a TomTom or anything like that, it just basically puts that on your phone. And you can download up to eight maps with those man. So you can get the whole mm-hmm. of the UK or the whole of the country that you live in. And even if your phone connection went down, you'd still have access for some time to GPS. This, this stores the map on your phone and then shows you where it is in relation to the GPS coordinates. It's pretty awesome. Um, I'd also recommend Saildroid, which gives you a magnetic compass and a speed bearing and, and GPS coordinates as separate instruments. Sort of like the instrumentation you get on the yacht, which is very good. That's also free. There is a um, G Strings guitar tuner. And I've got to fire up my phone. If you at all play guitar, there's another thing that, although it has advertising on it, it doesn't require you to be online, but it's basically every other resource you might want on a guitar. Um, it's called Smart Chord. It's fucking incredible for musicians. If you play any sort of stringed instrument, smart chord is where it's at. And of course, mm. VL- VLC. Take back control over your media with yep. VLC because the Android version is finally sorted and it's really, really good. Um, and that, anything else you wanted to add? No, that's good, dude. Okay, so our outro music is Night Tides by Loon Twin from the album Night Tides, which is part of the track. That's, again, thanks to Shane's promotion. And our background music, I got criticised for not mentioning the background music. It is royalty free from courtesy of YouTube, and it's Bearded Dragon by Techno Axe. 
So yeah, thank you very much for listening. It's been fun recording it. I've been B. I've been Graffin. And if you want to get involved, um, go along to uh, the IRC for Rangers, webchat.freenode.net, hash rangers, R4NGER5, or email me at b4b at earthling.net. It's been fun. Take care. Deep space exploration ramps up, it'll be the corporations that name everything. The IBM Stellar Sphere, the Microsoft Galaxy, Planet Starbucks.